than these things today, they've got them on the, in the newspaper, they've got them on the news channels. I've told you all time and time again that they own the newspapers, publishing companies, as well as every television network, as far as I know, throughout the whole world. It says here, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of uh, evidence here of what I'm saying. 1960, the leaders of the Canadian Nazi Party was John Beatty. Everything from his group name and its major activities was suggested or quarterbacked by persons acting as agents for the reporting to the Canadian Jewish Congress. What is a Canadian Jewish Congress? Well, they were all Jews. The Canadian Jewish Congress, which largely created the short-lived Canadian Nazi Party, had since the 1930s been lobbying for restrictions or freedom of speech. They did this for a long time. How did they finally bring it to pass? It says that it was used as an argument <clears throat> frightening to cause Jewish people to be afraid and so forth. It was used as an argument for 1971 hate law, the hate law section 319, Canadian Criminal Code 1005. In 1990, Grant Bristow, an associate of the Canadian Jewish Congress and the agent of Canadian Secret Service, CSIS, Security Intelligence Service, took a leadership role in the right wing German-Canadian advocacy group, the Heritage Front, including supplying them with money. Bristow frequently advocated violence against Jews. Now, he got these other people, was giving them Jews. Where does all this go? He was far more uh, than a mere informant or a spy. He compiled targets for prominent Jews. He actually was coming against them. But look what it says. He was a player and a strong advocate for lawlessness and anti-Jewish ad agitator. In other words, he was stirring this up. But now notice what it says. This was useful to Zionists and rab rabbis or rabbinical interest. How was it useful to them? While isolated cases of spontaneous anger and violence against Persians dominated as Judaics, rabbis and Israelis is sometimes tragically real. I mean, people come against them. But in my opinion, sometimes they bring this upon themselves if this specific group that comes against them has not been hired. Notice what they say. The organizations and agitated a violent movement dedicated to hating Jews, Judaic people, on a regional and national scale is often covert functions of Zionist and rabbinical groups themselves, in clandestine or secret alliance with the secret services of the Western intelligence in Britain, Germany, and Canada. What does this tell you? If you go on and read these articles here that are very real, they've got this stuff documented very well, they needed people to come against them so they could hate the, so they could pass the hate law speech in France and Germany. They wanted people to come against Jews so they could actually pass the hate crime bill. And that stopped people from saying anything about a Jew. Where does that go? How could you preach the Bible today without saying something about the Jews? The Bible is all about Jews and God all through the Old Testament. It tells you about the story of how the Jews hated Jesus because he was not after money. They were all after money. He wanted to heal the sick. He wanted to help the poor people. But the Jews were against that. Therefore, they wanted to kill him. He wanted to heal the sick, raise the dead. They said then they wanted to kill him. I mean, I could take you and show you in John's gospel, in John chapter 11, when Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. For those people that are probably 
against what I'm saying. Look here, I'll read it to you before I go to Revelation 13. If you notice something, this is very important, that they never had any fear of God. Why didn't they have any fear of God? It tells you because they think that they are holier than God. Their father in Isaiah 14, 14 said, I will rise above the throne of God and I will be above the Most High. He said he would rise against God. That's Satan himself. And Jesus said in John chapter 8, 44, you're of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you'll do. Nevertheless, look what happened here in John chapter 11 after Jesus rose the dead, rose him from the dead. It said in verse 47, then gathered the chief priest and the Pharisees a council and said, what are we going to do? This man doeth many miracles. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. In verse 49, one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it's expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Now this is the high priest. Why had he said this? Because Jesus had said, and they knew he said he was God, and they said he was the Son of God, and this is not secretly told. Everybody in the New Testament knew about it. Look what it says. Verse 50, Nor consider it's expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation to perish. Verse 51, This spake he not of himself. Now this is a prophecy from the high priest. This spake he not of himself, but being a high priest that same year prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but for those that should gather together in one children of God that were scattered abroad. Now look what he said in verse 53, John chapter 11. Pay close attention. From that day forth they took counsel to put him to death. I mean, you all know what that means. How bold can you be or how stupid can you be? Jesus just raised the dead. I mean, he says here in John chapter 11, verse 40. He goes on with 41 and 42. And Lazarus came forth in verse 43. He said it and it happened. How are you going to put somebody to death and he just raised the dead? You find that a little strange? How many of y'all understand mental illness? <laughs> huh? Come on, somebody say amen. We made up uh, some programs and we were talking about mental illness. How many of y'all thank God for the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost produces faith in your life. Nobody can have faith that it takes to get to heaven without the Holy Ghost. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're not going to have any faith. You can go back in Galatians 5 and look at the fruits of the Spirit of God, which is the Holy Ghost, and you'll find out that He puts faith in your life. That's what the Holy Ghost is there for. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, He's there to help you to profit in every way. He's there to help you to overcome the devil. He's there to help you to live victoriously. He's there to help you to do the work of God. He's there to help you to heal the sick. He's there in John 14, 16 to help you to pray. Without a stupid prayer shawl, he's there to do all the great things for you. And many people today are trading the Holy Spirit for a worthless piece of rag they call a prayer shawl. And it's money too. Anyway, I'm going to take you to Revelations 13. And I want to show you, I was looking this morning, I think somewhere around 95 times, excuse me if that's not right. In the New Testament, they use the words, and I think it's more than that, of mind, M-I-N-D. So many people today are basically brainwashed. They don't know that they need the Holy Spirit and they think they can't do something when all the time they're just separated from the Holy Spirit. Why would they be separated from the Holy Spirit? Because the preachers they listen to, the pastors they've got, and for brainwashing through television. I had a lady to tell me, she said, well, you're against TV? I said, yes. I think it's the greatest tool Satan has ever used against this country. I said, and I think I can prove that. 
And she said, well, you're, that's kind of hypocritical, ain't it? You're against television, but yet you're on television. I said, well, ma'am, I said, you kind of have to look at it like this. The world is evil, right? But Jesus went out into the world to preach the gospel. I mean, I could use many more examples. <clears throat> Some people said, oh, the world is evil. I'm not going outside. Well, Jesus went out, but he went uh, at the specific times when he was led by the Lord. Nevertheless, in Revelation 13, I want you to notice, and I believe you'll get something out of this if you go with me. The Bible said in Revelation 13, I stood upon the sands of the sea, verse 1, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And his heads, on his heads was the name of blaspheming. He was against God. Tells you a little bit about the head, or about the beast in verse 2. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, had feet of a bear, mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power with great authority. If you look in verse 3, this is one of the most amazing scriptures you're going to find in the Bible. In verse 3 it said, And I saw one of his heads that was, were wounded to death. Now he had seven heads and ten horns in verse 1. One of his heads was wounded unto death. And the deadly wound, and it says it was a deadly wound, meaning it was like a death was healed, and all of the world wondered after this beast. Now this is kind of, I think, very informative if you've got your ears open. There's many people, though, today that have eyes to see and see not, and ears to hear that hear not. But the Bible said, hear what the Spirit said to the church. Some people have to prepare themselves a little bit, but we'll kind of go along with you. Notice what it says. This is very informative. In verse number 11, And I beheld, and another beast come up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake of the dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwelleth thereupon to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. So that's the beast over there in verse 3. What's confusing about this chapter is they don't know how to look at the beast. The beast, they think, is one. But the beast has seven heads, so you can look at it in different ways. So actually what it says, this verse 14, this, first, this other beast in verse 11, he rises up and look what he said in verse 14. He deceiveth them that dwell upon the earth, by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of all of the beasts, saying to them that dwell upon the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak, now notice this is important, and cause that as many as would not worship the image that he should be killed. Let's stop right there for a minute. It goes really, I mean, this is really kind of fascinating stuff. People have no idea who the head is that was wounded unto death. It's not hard to figure that out. When you find out that Israel plays a great part in the Bible, as I said, it's all about God and it's all about the Jews throughout the whole Old Testament. One thing you can never find in the Old Testament or the New Testament is that the Jews ever repented and came to God. Never happened. He talked about that in Romans chapter 9. All of them weren't saved. He said, well, there is an Israel which is of God, and there's an Israel which is not of God. And a mixed multitude come out of Egypt with them, and they were never saved. But they come along, and they caused a lot of trouble. You find out some more about this as the principles of the Bible, if you're looking for the Jews, you find out that five things in your Bible never changes. What is that? One of them is God. He never changes. Amen? Hebrews 13 and 8. One thing is the devil. He don't ever change. Jesus said he come to steal, kill, and to destroy. You can look at the Bible. It never changes. You can look at the world. It never changes. You can look at the Holy Spirit. It's there. It never changes. 
You know, so we look at these things, and I could name more about that, but that's the five main things that you have to learn about the Bible if you want to interpret it correctly. You can't add to it. You can't take it away. The Bible never changes. If the Jews didn't repent in the Bible, it never happens. This is the way it is, and they never repent. Now, if you look at this verse 3, notice what it says. It says this clearly, that the whole world wondered after the beast. We know that the beast was destroyed, this head of the beast, this particular head was destroyed in 70 A.D. when Rome came after the temple and Israel because they wanted war and they kept fighting and they kept killing and they kept destroying and, you know, their money didn't do them very much good whenever uh, they came to destroy them. Titus, on orders of his father, they worked together and they destroyed the temple and took it down. I mean, it took down the whole thing. But it wasn't completely destroyed. I read in history with the stones, one upon another one, till 300 and something A.D. They kind of said they did that, but that never really happened. Jesus said it would happen in Matthew 24, but it never really happened until then. So you find out by looking closely that Israel is the head that was wounded. I'm going to give you a little bit of a bit more understanding <clears throat> if you look at this real closely the woman it talks about her in verse number 7 chapter 17 revelations look what it says here they have a little different description of her It says, And the angel said unto me, he's talking to John, Wherefore do you marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which have seven heads and ten horns. Now the woman rides the beast in Revelations. What people do not understand is that the United States does everything that Israel wants them to do. There is not one thing that they do not want the United States to do that they don't do it. We supply their money. What do they do? They go to the Yeshiva University and they learn about the Talmud or they learn about the Kabbalah. They don't serve Jesus Christ. They say that openly. They don't want anything to do with Jesus. I wonder why it is that our nation gives them so many billion dollars every year. Isn't that strange? It's because they own every television, every network station, all the newspapers. They own it all. They've owned them since way back in the 1800s. I mean, they're in charge of everything. You can find out something... Here, I'm going to read to you for, I don't want to, I have to limit my time here, so I'm trying to do the best I can. 17, Revelation 17, 2. The kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Wine of her fornication, you can find that comes out in verse 1. The great whore set up upon many waters. Israel was always a whore. You look at the word... 2181 in Strong's Bible Concordance in the Hebrew, it's 94 times that it shows Israel as being a whore, guilty of worshiping other gods, guilty of sodomy, guilty of all kind of sexual perversion that you could name, and she never one time gives her life to God. She's the whore all the way back. Deuteronomy, she was the whore in Exodus chapter 24, verse number 6, 7, and 8. She gave her life to God. She made a covenant and she got in a marriage with God, which is a covenant. And Exodus 32, she began to strip off naked and worship a golden calf and have all of the things that go along.